Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Sarah Jane Finlay, and I am the Associate Vice President for Equity and Inclusion here at UBC. It is uh, indeed my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to tonight's discussion, The Power of Diversity, Better Decisions, Better Outcomes. This event uh, reflects the university's commitment to inclusion, which is a core element in UBC's uh, new strategic plan and also our continuing passion to cultivate and expand our understanding of critical issues facing our society. I'm pleased that we're able to convene this event as an opportunity to facilitate dialogue, share knowledge, uh, and inspire change at UBC and beyond. Uh, now before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of the hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people. Tonight's event is in partnership with Alumni UBC and UBC's Equity and Inclusion Office. We've been bringing important conversations to the forefront together for the last couple of years. And we've partnered to host events on current and topical subjects. So thank you very much for taking the time to come uh, and join us tonight and to participate in the discussions that will follow. We're really thrilled to be able to welcome you to this uh, beautiful, uh, Robert H. Lee Alumni Center, which is a home for alumni for life. Our alumni community now is 337,000 strong, living in more than 148 countries. Some pretty good diversity there. Uh, as well as hosting events like tonight's, Alumni UBC offers an array of programs and services to benefit you and engage you in the life of UBC from career resources, stimulating intellectual programming like this evening, uh, reunions, networking connections, and mentoring opportunities, to the award-winning Trek magazine, Alumni UBC keeps you current and connected. Now, tonight's conversation is currently being live streamed. Hello out there. And a recording of this evening's program will be made available on the Alumni UBC Digital Library as well as on the website, uh, the events page of the Equity and Inclusions website. So a special thanks uh, to our webcast partner, the Irving K. Barber Learning Center, who's providing this live stream of our event. Now usually at about this time in these kinds of opening remarks and housekeeping details, we would be asking you to turn off your cell phones, but don't do that. We would love it if you would tweet the event tonight uh, and you um, would use the address at alumni UBC and at UBC equity. And our hashtag is uh, hashtag inclusive UBC. Tonight, we're also going to be using Slido. And this is an audience engagement platform which allows us to include everyone in the conversation. So any mobile device will work with this web-based platform. And I'm gonna walk you through how to use it now. So please, pull out your device and follow along with my crystal clear instructions. Um, so the first thing you need to do is to go to slido.com. That's S-L-I-D-O dot com. Uh, the URL and tonight's hashtag are being projected on the screen. And then the hashtag that you need to be able to, to sign in at uh, slido.com is diversity. I'll give you a couple of seconds to get your devices out and get to slido.com and get logged in. So a lot of people staring at their screens. So this platform allows you to ask questions and make comments in real time throughout tonight's program. You can input questions by clicking on the Ask button. Other attendees then have the opportunity to like your question by giving it a thumbs up to the right. And when we get to the Q&A portion of the evening, our moderator will address the top questions from the audience to the panel. If you wish to direct your uh, questions to one panelist in particular, please type their name 
followed by the question. So again, the URL is slido.com and the sign-in hashtag is diversity. That's the, that's, oh. Oh, okay, sorry, I'm reading my notes here. Uh, my apologies. Okay, and so that is also the hashtag then for uh, tweeting. Um, so the, we'll be sharing the URL and the hashtag on the slide deck throughout the program. Um, and we'll also be providing a mic um, in the audience for those who wish to pose a question in the more traditional way. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening. Angela Sterrett, a UBC alumni and a Gixson woman, is an award-winning journalist, writer, and artist. She currently works with CBC Vancouver as a television, radio, and online reporter, producer, and host. Her reports have appeared in The Globe and Mail, The National, CBC's The Current, and various other national and local news programs. In 2017, Angela accepted the Investigative Award of the Year from Journalists for Freedom of Expression for her team at CBC Indigenous and their coverage of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Please join me in welcoming Angela. Thank you so much, Sarah Jane, and hello to you all. It's great to see so many people out. Thank you for, for being here and uh, being curious and interested about this conversation. Well, diversity, inclusion, and equality are becoming more and more important in our communities today. No matter what industry, what company, or community you belong to, it may be evident that we are lacking in diversity. And may I say that is not evident here. And to my great pleasure to see so many people of many different backgrounds, um, it may be becoming increasingly important, especially to people of diverse backgrounds, to be reflective of the world and we live in but often we don't see that. I want to know what's stopping us. Sorry, I just realized I was not as close to the mic as I needed to be. Um, how do we get there? How do we get our workplaces to be more diverse and what's stopping us? Well, I'm very excited to find out more from our expert panelists and how inclusion of diverse voices and perspectives deliver more innovation, more creativity, and more inclusive outcomes, whether it's in health, science, research, or the wider community. Please welcome them all to the stage now. First, uh, to the right of me, directly to the right of me, is UBC alumna Tina Strelka. She's the CEO of Minerva BC, leading a team of thoughtful, talented change makers who develop, empower, and promote women's leadership. Tina is leading Minerva BC into its third decade, holy smokes, and enjoys working at the intersection of education, leadership, and reconciliation. So welcome her to the stage. And Daniel Steele, Dr. Daniel Steele, is an associate professor of the W. Maurice Young Center for Applied Ethics in the School of Population and Public Health. Current research includes Shirk-funded uh, Shirk funded, Shirk funded project on different concepts of diversity and how these are relevant to explanations of how diversity can generate better science or better science-informed policy. Hello, welcome. And Dr. Manel Matani is the senior advisor to the provost. I'm told I might be saying that wrong, depending on which area you are. It might be provost, provost. On racialized, fa on racialized faculty, a new position at UBC that will support the university's institutional commitment to advancing equality and inclusion in the scholarly and leadership environment for faculty members at UBC. Dr. Matana is also a professor at the Institute of Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social, Social Justice in the Faculty of Arts. Welcome. Applause 
And last but not least, UBC alum Dr. Kendall Ho was an emergency medical specialist at Vancouver General Hospital in Vancouver, BC, Canada, and a professor in the UBC Faculty of Medicine Department of Emergency Medicine. He leads the Digital Emergency Medicine Unit and is the executive director of the Intercultural Online Health Network, funded by the Ministry of Health. Please join me in welcoming all of the incredible experts this evening. All right, so before we get going, I just want to remind you to feel free to submit audience questions online. I will uh, try my best to get the most popular questions during the Q&A portion of tonight's program. So as questions come up, do feel free to um, put your questions in the um, sli Slido. All right, so welcome, good evening to you all. Um, I'm very curious, you're all from different fields, um, health, education, um, equity, innovation. Um, what have you all noticed in terms of diversity in your workplaces or in your fields? Um, what, are the, what are the challenges that you've seen? We'll start with you, Tina. Thank you. Well, Minerva BC is a charitable organization that really focuses on women. So that's really where our focus is. We look at the representation of women in leadership. We also look at the representation of indigenous women in leadership in British Columbia. And we know overwhelmingly that women are underrepresented in all aspects of leadership, whether that's in community, whether that's in politics, whether that's in the corporate sector. A lot of our work stemmed from working with young girls high school age girls in, in developing leadership programs and then women in leadership programs. And then what we heard from them was, hey, yeah, it's great for me to develop my leadership skills, but I'm still facing barriers in the workplace. So there are systemic and invisible barriers that still hold women back from leadership. Um, yeah, thank you. That's an interesting question for me. Uh, one of the ways I experienced that myself in my own workplace is by uh, being a spousal hire, which meant that um, if someone hired for fit, I probably wouldn't be the person that would have been hired. Did and you say spousal hire? Spousal hire, yes. yes so I'm, what does that mean exactly? Oh, that means, oh, I'm sorry. I forget I'm not talking. So my, my wife is also a professor here at UBC, is a Canada Research Chair, and I came to UBC because she was offered a job here, and then I was, uh, we had both had jobs at a, our previous uh, university, and we wouldn't move unless we both had jobs, so I needed to get a job too to come, and for them to get her, and so, that means that I was sort of plopped down and in, in a place where if they had been hiring for fit, I wouldn't be the person they would hire. And so I experienced some of the challenges that comes with that. Um, so there are things like not, uh, not having the expertise to teach courses that are, for example, considered core in the field, in the, in the department, for example. And, and I... And, uh, um, and also having a sense for the kinds of discussions that happen in, about what should the, you know, the core focus of the department be and so forth. All right. Mm -hmm. And just to, to let our audience know, we're going to get to that conversation mm -hmm. about hiring for fit because mm -hmm. it's uh, something that is, I've just learned about tonight. It's a very curious uh, mm -hmm. question for me. So we will get to that in just mm -hmm. a moment. But Manel, what about you? What are some of the, the challenges you've seen around diversity in, in your workplaces? Yeah, I mean, for me, this is such an intrinsically personal question. It's hard for me to think about diversity without thinking about my own kind of complex, circuitous, and sometimes tortured history in the workplace and in school. And maybe some of you have had that experience, too, of never knowing if you really fit in, people seeing you to be a little bit different, and sometimes experiencing forms of racism or exclusion, and never knowing exactly what that's about or what's happening. So for me, it isn't just a question around diversity, it's a question of equity and inclusion. Because really, I'm, I'm less interested in diversity in terms of many different people being in the room. I want to know who has power and how we make the landscape more equitable for everybody in the room. And certainly that's something that I really connect with and have intimately experienced over time. And Kendall, same question to you. What, what kind of challenge did, challenges arise in your workplace in terms of diversity? Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, in fact, I was just, uh, when you asked that question, I was reflecting. I was working in the emergent department this morning. And in fact, the different types and different people that I meet, uh, not types, but different individuals that I meet, diversity becomes so important for us to understand. I'm very glad I'm meeting you here, not in my emergent department, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, but to be uh, really understanding about 
the right type of therapy. It's not only important for me to understand as professional what medication we should prescribe, uh, what types of therapy I should offer, but really understand the individual to say what his or her background is, and as I interact with him or her, how do I actually start with that understanding before I suggest what my therapy is? Because different people will react differently, and different people will take in information very differently. And so the understanding diversity becomes so important for me to work in the part, emergency department in a multicultural community like British Columbia that we have. So, so this is a very important topic for me to understand and learn. All right, let's actually go, go into that, the, 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 the statement that you made around hiring for fit. As I said, I actually hadn't heard of that. Um, I've been a journalist for 20 years, and that was a new statement, but it seems like it's very common in uh, educational institutions and as well as some, some industries. Maybe, Manel, we'll start with you. Um, well, first of all, how many people here have heard that before, hiring for fit? So a lot of people. So maybe, Manel, tell, tell me about the, the complexities of that. What does that mean, and what are the, the challenges around hiring for fit? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us in this room, again, have had this experience where fit becomes this very difficult, nebulous notion to pin down. Who fits within an organization and why? And a lot of time, we buy into a like, likes, like model. We tend to hire people just like us. Oh, they went to, uh, they went to Dalhousie. Oh, well, maybe you know, we should bring them on board because that's a good fit. But we don't think about the possibilities and the opportunities that come from thinking about diversity. We know from experience that when we hire for diversity, it means to, leads to better outcomes, it leads to better retention rates, it leads to innovation and collaboration and different forms of communication. It leads to a certain kind of creative flourishing to emerge within an institution. But when we hire people just because, ah, I think I just want to have lunch with them for the next 30 years, as we tend to do at different universities, we really aren't taking advantage of opportunities of enlarging our notion of fit. So I personally think fit is a very kind of exclusionary term to use. Mm -hmm. I think it's also Eurocentric, and I think it can also evoke questions around bias in terms of racism and sexism as well. So my goal is always to go back to what are the core values of your organization? What is it that you're trying to, you're trying to put forward in terms of what you stand for as organization? Hire for that. So for example, here at UBC, what are we committed to as an institution? We're committed to collaboration, innovation, equity. Those are the core values. So when we're hiring somebody, do those people represent those core values? How do we know that they stand for those core values? That's what we should be looking for in terms of fit. Hmm. And um, Tina, I'm thinking of you and in your organization. How do you sort of break out of that hiring for fit, people that just seem to fit with the organization? How do you break out of that so you do create diversity in your workplace? I think it's a good question. I'll answer both from the perspective of when I've been in HR and done that hiring, but also for the organizations that Minerva has encountered and has worked with. Um, I would very wholeheartedly agree that the, the focus on values and really what's the, what's the alignment there is the critical piece. And I do think the, the terminology around fit grew out of that. I think it grew out of an attempt for organizations to say, well, this is a good match for us because we're aligned. But I do think it often distills down to, is that a person I want to go out on a Friday night with or go out for beers after work with? I do think it, it distills to that. So I do think values. The other areas, I think, this being really clear on the strengths and the skills and the talent you need. Because diversity can also be watered down. If you don't have the right skills in place to do the job, then you can get into conflict around diversity because someone will say, well, this is, a, this is me being diverse, but, and there's conflict, but the conflict is actually about the skills not matching the role that you need. So values and strengths, skills, being really clear, what do I need to do the job? And then looking at if you bring someone to the table who's different, you know, if you have two people who can do the job the same, the person who doesn't match your dominant culture in your workplace is the better hire because they're bringing a facet of diversity and different thinking and different backgrounds. That actually becomes an advantage. Yeah. And I don't know who, who, who would like to answer this, anybody, but in, in terms of we, we do hear about discrimination in hiring practices since we're on that topic. Um, I've done stories where um, people of various different backgrounds will change their last name on a resume so that it actually looks more Anglo. Um, I myself have never put that I'm Indigenous on my resume. I've never ticked that box because I know that there's, it's most likely that I'm not going to get the job because of that. Um, 
when we're doing hiring, is there is there an opportunity with a per, from if a person has a is is at a higher level, you know, a, an executive to, to be able to speak out against that? Um, how do we switch those patterns? Because it does seem to be a very common practice. There does seem to be discrimination in hiring practices, and we see that in our workplaces when most of them are. Um, white, very white. Um, I've, I see that in my own workplace. I see that at the awards that we visit. Um, how do we break out of that? Anybody who wants to jump in. Maybe I'll, I'll tackle that. Quite, maybe I'll combine the previous one and tackle that question a little bit. Not that I have all the answers, obviously. I think, I, I, I think in, in medicine and perhaps in all health professions, fit. I think there are three components to it. I think number one is to have the skills and the knowledge to be able to support the professional, develop, the professional delivery of services. I think that's one very important area of fit. And so to be able to, you know, again, choosing right therapy at the right situation, make the right decisions at those times will be very important. But I think another very important component of fit or competence uh, in, in medicine or nursing or pharmacy, I think it, it would be uh, applied to all the health profession, is how do we understand and communicate? Uh, because it's such a high-touch type of practice uh, that we really need to understand the individuals and, and how do we then tailor our advice to the individuals. And I think that's where diversity comes in. But I think the third area, very important, is the fact that we always emphasize, it, it, size, that it, we need to be lifelong learner. We don't come into this world diverse. Uh, the fact is, we all learn about diversity as we move forward. And so just as the skills and knowledge, we are lifelong learner. Just as we communicate with the different individuals, it's lifelong learning. In the same way about diversity, understanding how do we embrace that, and especially in a community like Vancouver, in a, in a country like Canada where we do embrace it as a value, how do we do the lifelong learning so that we can do that? And so perhaps I, uh, from, from a, a medical school point of view, uh, again, I'm not in charge of medical admission, so I, I, I obviously want to give uh, um, uh, credit to our medical school and our mission process, is that they look for that kind of diversity. They look for historically, you know, when I was applying for medical school, it's primarily about science. Uh, but now, actually, medical school applications open to all kinds of professions, all kinds of undergraduate schools, and also diversity of cultures. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's also in terms of uh, when I was going through medical school, uh, primarily the class were male dominant, uh, but now in fact it's about 60% female, 40% male. And so I think that that kind of uh, gradual adaptation, but again as a school we need to continue to learn about different diversity as we move forward. Can I jump in there? If that's yeah, all right. absolutely. Um, I love that you just talked about that because I think that's such an, it's a really great example of how we can begin to bring in questions of equity and inclusion. So let me give you another example similar to what you, know, you just mentioned, but still a little different. So here at UBC, we have a really great school of journalism. And I think we're doing wonderful things in the school of journalism that I think several people can to attest to. But about 10 years ago, the school noticed that they weren't doing a great job in recruiting indigenous students to the school. And you know, we kind of looked at the data and wondered why that might be the case. And we took a long, hard, cold look at our values and what the school stood for in terms of thinking about recruiting indigenous students as well as students of color. And we asked a really important question. What are we doing to make them feel welcome? Why would they even want to come to the School of Journalism? And so we started looking at the admissions process and asking how do we actually ask people to apply? And we thought about it for a while and we realized Indigenous culture is an oral culture, and we're asking people to apply using written text and actually submitting you know, um, things like, uh, like SAT scores and things like that. That doesn't connect with indigenous communities. So the admission process changed. The school started relying on interviews rather than you know, the written word or you know, things like SATs in order for admission. That changed the way that we recruited students. Doing interviews on the phone, completely revamp the kinds of students who actually applied to the school. But that wasn't enough. Once you get them in the door, doesn't mean they're going to stay. How do you make sure that indigenous students and faculty of color stay at your school? It's the warmth of the welcome. There's a professor here, Dan Hebert. He's in the Department of Geography. And I always remember him telling me this. You want people to feel welcome, so how do you create that warm welcome? It's during orientation. 
So we asked who could we get in to do the orientation at the School of Journalism. And we asked Duncan McHugh to come in. And a lot of you will know Duncan. He's an extraordinarily talented indigenous journalist who, of course, we hear on CBC all the time. So just by having an indigenous journalist up at the front of the, on the podium speaking had made such a big difference for the indigenous students in that class. So these are the sorts of things that can be done, but it's all, it's, it has to be very careful work, it has to be constantly you know, consulting with people in the communities and thinking about what you really want to accomplish. And this takes time, but it's all about relationship building. And Daniel, I mean, in your experience, I mean, how far have we come? How are we doing um, when it comes to, to diversity? Well, that's a tough question. So um, maybe I'll pick up on some of the issues that uh, Manette yeah. just discussed. And that is um, just getting people in the door isn't enough. And, and I think the, the points about well, being welcoming and, uh, and the, 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 the sense of warmth is very important. But also, often it's deeper things than that. So even if people are, people are nice, and that's, let's say we're talking about faculty at a university or I think in any other, in any other kind of workplace, there's going to be certain things in a workplace, they're considered important. These are really the things we do here. And those things might have been decided a long time ago. Those things might have been decided when, at a time when diversity or, you know, was not even something that people talked about or just the homogeneity of a particular group, say white males, was taken just for granted, or just when particular kinds of questions were whatever the thing that this department or this, this workplace did. And those become embedded in, if you're talking about a, a university department, and what are the courses that are required to get degrees in that, in that program? Well, that's going to make a difference to who we hire. And even if we hire someone who doesn't fit, right? If we hire someone we're not, not going to hire for fit, we'll hire someone who's different. Well, then they might feel like, well, what do I do in this department? How can I teach these courses? That's not, that's not what I do. I'm not the kind of person who this program was designed you know, around. And, so I totally agree with these points about the warmth of welcome, but oftentimes there's something deeper behind that, and it's, that needs to be rethought. So let me just give one example about the School of Population and Public Health, which has recently um, developed a new program um, in indigenous health um, that aims to provide education to people who are doing um, public health work in indigenous communities. And it's, it doesn't require that these people have advanced degrees. It's, it's something that's designed to address issues and needs that were um, raised, I think, by people in indigenous communities. So there's creating something, right? So it's more than, well, we're nice and we'll be welcoming to you when you arrive, but there's got to be something there. This institution is, isn't, it's one thing to be nice. It's another thing that this institution seems like it's something that's where your interest or w the things you might think are important feel like they belong. Mm -hmm. And there's always a challenge there because I think there's no way that any department or any company can do everything. There always has to be some kind of focus. Um, but at the same time, you don't want the focus to be such that it just excludes um, aspects of whatever this thing is that, that are important. Yeah, it's really interesting what the two of you are mm -hmm. saying because you're kind of speaking to this idea that we hear a lot from the indigenous community and that's decolonization. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, essentially it's taking a culture that is very monolithic mm -hmm. and homogenous, mm -hmm. British, mm -hmm. English, we're all speaking English, um, one colored, and, uh, and, and, and forcing that upon people, right? Mm -hmm. And so you guys are, I think, both talking and riffing off this idea that we need to diversify our mm -hmm. structures, right? And what does that look like? It's mm -hmm. really difficult when they're so embedded in everything we do. Mm -hmm. um, Tina, I'm just wondering, from your standpoint, um, how, how do you do that in an organization? You've, three decades you've been working at this organization? No, I haven't been working at The three organization, organization has, is, been, yes, yes. has been going yeah. on for three decades. How do, you, how do you look at an organization that's been going on? I mean, three decades is not very long. Um, but how do you take an organization that has been, universities have been around for so long. A lot, I went to Massey College. I did my fellowship there. It's all... Um, religious, everything is designed by religion. It's super colonial, super uncomfortable for a lot of people um, who come from a place where they've been abused in those kind of scenarios. But how do you take a structure and, um, and, and create it so that it's, so more people are welcome or feel more comfortable? How do you kind of deconstruct something like that? 
Well, for me, I think the first uh, step in that is the will. So I really agree with the perspective that you have to take a step back and see where are we starting from and who am I trying to meet, right? So if, in the case of women, a lot of organizations are trying to figure out, well, why aren't we attracting women? Why aren't they applying? Why aren't they moving from middle management to senior management? So they're, identif they're identifying something that's not working, so no different than we're not attracting Indigenous students to the School of Journalism. So I think if you start with that curiosity, then you start to uncover and unpack, well, what do I need to do to meet that person where they're at? Mm. With women in particular, it's something very interesting about so that attraction element is women will apply for jobs when they have 90% or more of the ticky box requirements. Men tend to apply if they have 50% or less. That's research done by IBM. That's a, that's a research study. And it's anecdotal, and, and we can joke about that and sort of say, oh, it's about confidence, it's about this and about that. It, there's actually deeply embedded behaviors around that that are gendered around rule following or not wanting to waste time and women sort of, you know, not necessarily that they lack confidence, but they truly um, sort of believe that, well, if it's put out there, then I'm going to respect that and adhere to that. So one of the steps is to even put on a job description. You know, if you, even if you don't meet all these requirements, but you think you're a great candidate, please apply. Um, same goes with negotiation. Women don't negotiate as much as men. So it, when that invitation comes and is open, but it's understanding and knowing, well, why is there a gap and being curious about, well, why, isn't, why aren't things progressing? and then trying to deconstruct from there. There is a lot of, there's explicit bias and there's implicit, right? So we have, you know, we, there are people who will come and say, you know, don't hire anyone who looks like this or talks like this or, you know, doesn't speak. There are, there's absolutely so that overt discrimination, but we also have underlying systems and structures that aren't obvious. And so someone walking into Massey College who, who maybe doesn't have that background wouldn't see the oppression of that colonialism, wouldn't feel it in the same way. So I work for an organization and I have indigenous colleagues and they'll stop me mid-sentence and say, that's a dominant worldview you're holding. And I'm stopped in my tracks, like, what? What are you talking about? And then I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. But you have to be open mm -hmm. to doing that and stepping into that and then deconstructing mm -hmm. from there. So I think a big part is just the willingness. And Kendall, you're nodding your head a lot. And I'm just thinking you come from a field um, that a lot of uh, diverse people have not been comfortable entering. We've heard about deficits in the healthcare system in terms of um, people, I won't get into specific details or, or stories, but people um, in emergencies not feeling comfortable going there because they don't feel safe. Um, they don't feel like they're going to be treated as human. Um, but I've heard, I've done so many stories about this, and I know there's been great strides made in the healthcare industry um, or healthcare field. To, they recognize that this is happening. Tell me, tell me about that. Tell me about um, the challenges that, that you have in the medical field to make people feel safe in a place that is essentially for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just listening to this. In fact, um, uh, in medicine, we always talk about we need to know what we don't know, yeah. but we also don't know what we don't know. <laughs> um, and this is one of those areas. Uh, very fortunate. I, I, I feel very fortunate to be in UBC in faculty of medicine who promotes this understanding and also Ministry of Health who's actually funding a program called Intercultural Online Health Network which we look at. The reason I raise that is because one of the areas, in fact what propels me into this area is the privilege of going to indigenous communities as one example. Um, my department head, Dr. Jim Christensen, very interested in this area, working with Professor Jim Reading uh, from St. Paul's Hospital, very interested in how do we deliver, how can we deliver better care, emergency care, for our indigenous communities in British Columbia. And so with that, we were very fortunate to be welcomed into the community. But really understanding, uh, this is where we don't know what we don't know, that by going to the community, in fact, some of, in fact, what you, Angela, you alluded to, some community members were so traumatized historically in emergency department that they experienced discrimination, they experienced that the services they were, they were needed or seeking were not able to get, that even when they are very sick, they would not come to emergency department. This might be a foreign concept. It certainly is foreign to me. If I'm really sick, I would want to go to emergency department and you may share some of it. But sometimes the feeling is so strong in those communities that they say, even if I'm dying, I won't go there. And so that was a revealing moment for me to say, well, before we talk about how do we design better services for these communities, how do we reconcile that? How do we look at uh, the term is trauma-informed care? How do we actually understand that 
before we can get to the point of deliver services. Mm -hmm. And again, with the Intercultural Online Health Network, very fortunate that uh, now 10 years, uh, today is uh, uh, this year's 10 year anniversary, we were able to uh, engage Chinese and South Asian communities to start, because those are again two of the larger ethnic population in British Columbia, to again understand in, in more subtle ways, yet very powerful ways, how do we deliver services that may not meet the community's needs in the diversity that we have. And so again, um, but I think all these stories have one thing in common, and that is I think if, I think the communities are very, very, very interested to want to unveil those things so that they can be better served, so that we as a health system can serve them better. And I think I need to, we need to as a profession, to really genuinely go in. Because when we do, and when they do sense the genuineness, uh, they will open up and we will learn. I think that would be a very important area for us to, to start to understand, to learn what we don't know what we don't know, so that when these information comes, we'll open to understand how can we deliver best services. Mm -hmm. um, the conversation's kind of going all over the place and I'm really liking that. Um, it's like kind of going in a circle, as we say. But um, in terms of uh, solutions, I, we're talking, I guess, all about solutions, which is fantastic. Um, but how can we encourage more diversity within our specific fields? Um, Daniel, I'll start with you. Yeah. Um, how can we encourage more diversity? Uh, yeah, I mean, I... Yeah, so... No, no. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose there's a lot of good ideas already voiced. I mean... I think before asking that question, you want to think about what kind of diversity and why, mm -hmm. which is sort of in my research how I would come at it. I mean, what, what is it you're trying to do with the diversity? I mean, so there's a number of things. I mean, I think if you're talking about the, the examples that Kendall was, was just mentioning, you want to be able to better provide services, health services, to, to communities that his, historically have been less likely to access those services for maybe a number of different reasons. And we want to find out why. What is the problem? And so, I mean, I would say that that question in some ways needs to be unpacked and be to made more complex. What kind of diversity and why? And, mm -hmm. and it could be, so just to give some examples, it could be because there's a certain group that's tended to have been left out and marginalized. And I think in the discussion of indigenous health or in many other cases of inclusion of indigenous students, it's often that kind of situation. Another, in other cases, it just might be there's too many of one, there's a sort of predominance of one category. And that's problematic because that might mean that you have one way of thinking. And there, the, the predominance might not be, say, on ethnic lines. It might be everybody in this department does epidemiology and biostatistics, and we don't have enough people who approach public health from a social determinants of health point of view, for example. And so, so I guess that question of how you encourage diversity really is going to be dependent on what kind of diversity you're looking for and why you think it's going to be important. So I'm just curious um, from the four of you, when we're, when we're thinking about diversity, what, what are you thinking of? Like what, what is top of mind? What in your, in your fields of study, in your workplaces, in your institutions, what is lacking there in terms of diversity? Because you've brought up an interesting point. Is it that we all think the same, that we're all covering the same stories? Um, for me, we cover a lot of crime stories. Why are we all doing that? Well. The public seems to click on that a lot. Um, but, but what's lacking in your workplaces, if anybody wants to jump in? What's going to be individual? But. I'll, I'll tackle that first, uh, perhaps thinking about several dimensions. And, and, and Daniel already alluded to the, the social determinants of health. I think diversity, when I think about it, number one, culture does come into mind right away. I think that's number one. Mm -hmm. But secondly, it's uh, another important area is, is where we live. You know, urban, regional, rural, and remote. That brings to it a different area of diversity that we need to think about. And then the third is really the longitudinal age, the diversity of age and understanding from, pediatric, uh, from children to uh, uh, adolescents, to adults, to older population. Again, that's another different areas of diversity. And fourth, it's about socioeconomic differences. I think that in, in all those areas, and, and in fact, there, uh, Daniel can educate me much more on the different uh, social determinants of health, but each of those dimensions influence how do, we, how do I 
communicate with the patient with me, understanding that we have differences in background, and I need to reconcile that before a, a true communication can take place. Now, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, no, um, I think that's it's such a great question, Angela, in so many ways. Um, and I was thinking about how you just mentioned Massey College, which a lot of you will know is an important kind of institution at University of Toronto that has a journalism fellowship. And I'm a Massey fellow, actually, for years past, so I know exactly of what you speak. And uh, we were talking earlier about how journalism, as a lot of you will know, is predominantly white, and it's very difficult to tell stories about people of color in journalism, as a lot of you will know, um, through this piece that was written yesterday by Sonny Dillon that's getting a lot of press right now. A lot of you in the room will have seen it. He was a Globe and Mail uh, journalist who uh, suggested a certain storyline based on thinking about how it is that we're covering the elections here in Vancouver. And he was told, point blank, that the newsroom is not a democracy, point blank, and that his stories were not welcome. So it really behooves us to think about, well, if it's not a democracy, is there a place for stories that don't fit within the mold, that do not necessarily fit within the organization and what are our responsibilities around that. And I think that's something that we should all be thinking about in terms of you know, what might the Globe and Mail do. Now, normally what they would do is maybe bring in a consultant for a day and have a chat about how it is they're really committed to equity and inclusion. But that follows what we call the, the card effect, which is a crisis, action, relaxation, and then despair, right? This idea of being really reactive to a moment around, like an explosive moment around diversity without thinking about the long-term implications. So there needs to be a commitment on the part of the institution to really revamp the organization or bring in someone who has the facilitation skills to ask questions. What kind of organization could this be if we were really committed to equity and inclusion? And I see here in this room, we have Cicely Blaine, who is so good at this kind of work in terms of facilitating these kinds of dialogues and opening up spaces for anti-racist, you know, opportunities and having conversations that are no longer like sexist and are actually anti-oppressive spaces. So once we create those spaces to have those conversations, I think the opportunities to really support equity are immense. And just as we're talking about Massey College, one thing that came to mind when I went there as a journalism fellow, they had Johnny McDonald Day. And part of that would be celebrating quotes like they, Johnny McDonald felt all the Indians were savages. So these were things that people like me were subject to have to be a part of. So I think it's a really interesting conversation when we're talking about diversity in terms, in terms of our, our views, our political, our societal views. A really interesting question. We do have about two minutes left. Um, if anyone wants to jump in, I mean, how would an organization or institution begin to improve diversity in hiring within their sector? What's, what's a first step? I'll offer a little bit on there. I think there's a lot of work being done on implicit bias. Have you, have, can I get a show of hands? Unconscious bias, implicit bias, is that in, in the space? Very big in the corporate sector right now. Lots of training happening on unconscious bias. And it's quite interesting because if you understand, I'm not a scientist, but if you understand about unconscious bias, you can't train your way out of it. It's not a behavioral change that you can train staff out of. And so a lot of the dialogue with organizations who are serious about advancing diversity is how do we de-bias our systems? And that's really looking at how do, we, how do we do job applicants? How do we do the hiring process? How do we make selections? How do we not fall into that like, likes, like? Uh, oh, they went to Dalhousie, I went to Dalhousie. Oh, I like them already. And we fall into that. It's, and all of us are subject to that. So how do we put in safeguards so that we don't allow the biased humans to sort of let that bias run rampant? One of my favorite quotes that I heard about unconscious bias is if you're in a meeting and everyone agrees, yeah, yeah, that's, the great, that's a great idea, that's how we should go, we're all in agreement, you've got un unconscious bias going on because you've got that uh, sort of affirmative thing happening where you're agreeing with each other. So you have to tease out who sees it differently, who's got a different opinion, what are we missing here, who hasn't spoken yet, and really cultivating that time and space for curiosity. And it's hard because we live in a culture and a business environment that moves fast, uh, and doesn't always take the time to get to know people or hear all the diverse opinions and try and reconcile those. So I think it's a big undertaking. All right, well, we're gonna go into the Q&A period from the audience. Um, so I would like to ask that, I don't think we have any people asking on here yet, do we? I might not have, I don't have, it shows that I don't have questions. Um, and for people, sorry? 
There's lots. Okay. Um, for people that don't have um, or don't want to, to use this technology, um, please raise your hand because we'll also get to, to those questions as well while we're figuring this out. All right. So first we're going to go to uh, a question for Manel. Uh, how do you navigate power when, champions, when it champions diversity equity and inclusion on the outside, but falls short when it comes to genuine action reality? That's a great question, whoever asked yeah. that. So that. whoever asked that, that's basically the story of my life, <laughs> okay? So, I mean, I've, I've, you know, I'm, I'm a Muslim woman of Indian Iranian descent, and by all accounts, I should not even exist. I'm like an existential nightmare, because we know anything about Muslims and Indians and thinking about my experience as someone whose mother was Iranian and Muslim and my father's Indian and Hindu, there's a lot of tortured wars between these groups over years and decades and years, hundreds of years. So I really shouldn't exist. I've been struggling with this question my entire life, which what led me to this work in the first place. But part of what I like to do or think through in the work that I've tried to, to contemplate over the years of equity and inclusion is really try to think about who might my allies be and build up a base of support. And I think about it in terms of ways that I can persuade the persuadables. There's always gonna be a few people that I'm never gonna get on board as hard as I try. But there's always gonna be a typical 10, two or three people that I can persuade. And the way that I persuade them is thinking about this idea of creative serendipity. And this is not my concept, this concept comes from a planner here at UBC named Leonie Sandercock. A lot of you will know her. She is the expert on multicultural planning, I think, internationally. And when she explained to me what creative serendipity was, it really made me think differently. It's about these magical moments when strangers become friends, where we really see a connection between two people who wouldn't normally meet. Somehow they meet and they have a conversation and they learn from one another. So how might I create those moments of creative serendipity that'll open up spaces for a kind of exchange of power in some ways. And maybe that sounds idealistic, but even those moments open up spaces for possibilities in terms of thinking about configuring power in new and exciting ways and opening up the possibilities for people who are systemically disadvantaged. Hmm. Um, we have a question um, that asking, is disability included in tonight's definition of diversity? What is tonight's definition of diversity? And I think that's, that's something we've um, not included. We've excluded a conversation about disability. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to, to jump in on that. I'm happy to tackle that. Uh, uh, so I think thank you very much for that question. Uh, clearly, um, uh, disability uh, or challenges in certain approaches to life, it, all of us have. Having said that, there are some physical obvious disability, there are some mental disability, there are some other kinds of disability that are very challenging. And, uh, and so the question is how do we look at that uh, so as, a, as a physician? How do I understand that in delivering therapy? But also as a uh, health profession hiring, how do we recognize that and actually leverage that? to support us in doing so. I, as a health profession group, I'm not sure we are doing nearly as well as other groups, for example. Uh, there are uh, uh, groups, uh, uh, retailer, restaurants, do uh, have a ability to engage. I think that one of the examples I see that in, in health profession that help us tremendously, I sit in a building where it's a spinal cord um, uh, research center uh, where there is a preference to hire people with spinal cord injury so that not only can we develop uh, tools and research and approaches to manage uh, a patient with spinal cord, but they have lived experiences. And so in some ways in the health system, we also now in the last few years looking at the whole area of uh, patients and caregivers with lived experiences, we're embracing them to come and, and join together so that we can do research, we can do health services delivery. In fact, all the health authorities and Ministry of Health, again, very pro-engaging patients and caregivers to live that, uh, get that experience. Perhaps that's our transitional time so we can understand the different challenges, including disability, and how do we embrace it as a profession so that we can deliver that services better together. I'll just share. Yeah. Um, 
Last year, I had the opportunity to sit on an advisory group for a report that was done by the BC tech sector. So it was done by the HR tech group. And so there was someone advising. So I was there sort of holding the seat for women. Um, there was someone there holding the perspective of indigenous people. There was someone holding the perspective of people with disabilities. There's someone holding the perspective of immigrants. And so we all gave our pieces around you know, all these different underrepresented groups in the tech sector and what that means. And we were talking about resources. And there are, there's a lot of work being done in diversity, but it is quite siloed. And when I think about our work at Minerva, you know, all women are not the same no more than all men are the same no more than you know, we as human individuals don't. We have multifacets of diversity. And I think people with disabilities is one of the more invisible that is excluded. And one of the women at the table, and she said, well, you know, there's all these resources, but they are so siloed and they are individual. So I'm an indigenous woman with a mental health issue. Like, which website do I go to? Like, which, which, what's branded for me in terms of helping me navigate my own diversity journey or as an employer? And I think it's a really important point to think about in the diversity community and in those of us who are working towards advancing, there is a level of expertise that you need. So at Minerva, I hold expertise in what works for women as generalizations, knowing that all, not all women are the same, but there isn't a lot of collaboration necessarily between um, my group and people working with people with disabilities. But I will share an amazing resource. Uh, so the President's Group is an, or is an organization that was founded by the Liberal government, and it's CEOs and business leaders who have put out a wealth of resources about hiring people with disabilities. Their website is phenomenal, and they do lots of great work. It's all free worksheets and templates and lots of strategy and really positive underlying um, tools that can help organizations who want to diversify in that regard and their templates and um, uh, they, they work for all facets of diversity but are specifically focused on accessibility. So I'll share that. All right, and here's another uh, good question. How can we quantify or measure diversity? How could we predict whether a team is diverse enough? Is it about representation of stakeholders or something else? I'll be happy to, to take that one. Um, you'd actually, the person who asked this question might be surprised to know there actually are mathematical measures of diversity. I won't bore you with, <laughs> with describing them to you, but they exist and they're used in research. And in fact, there's a number of them and you could even look up papers that talk about a bunch of these things. Um, but what's probably more interesting is the concepts that are behind them. And so one way to think about diversity, well, diversity means whatever attribute you're talking about, if it's say, religion, if it's ethnicity, if it's gender, whatever it is, you sort of have equal proportions of the different things. But you can think about diversity in different ways. You can think about diversity, and here, I think we were encouraged to tell stories, so I'll tell a story. Um, so this is how I became interested in thinking about diversity and concepts of diversity, from an experience where I was uh, bringing my kids to Chinese school on a Saturday. I don't know if anybody who's ever in the audience had an experience of going to Chinese school on Saturdays, if you know. If you had that experience, you might, might bring back memories. But in any case, we, we were going to the Chinese school with the kids, and we were late because there was a traffic jam from the Vaisakhi Parade, which I think is probably an experience you can only have in Vancouver. So when we got there, two of the kids went to Chinese school because they didn't want to be late. But my daughter said, saw all this commotion, this fun. What is this about? So we just went to go and see, what is this, what is this parade about? And it was after Harper had lost the election to Trudeau, and there was someone on the stage talking, we're so happy we've got a new prime minister who cares about diversity. I was like, yeah, diversity. And I brought my daughter back to Chinese school and I thought about diversity. Yeah, it's a really diverse event. But I thought about it. Is it diverse? Well, it's not diverse in the sense that you've got a lot of people from different religions there because they're almost all Sikhs at this, at this event. Um, so it's not diverse in that first sense. So you've got sort of like equal proportions of the different things. But it's diverse in the sense that you've got all these people who are from a group that's not sort of the dominant religion in this case, if that seems like the relevant thing. And that's a different sense you can have of diversity. You might say, this group is really diverse because it's different from the thing that seems normal or non-diverse in the society in Canada. It might be Christian. Right? And there's other ways to think about diversity, too. You think diversity means you kind of represent, and that was kind of suggested in the question, represent the stakeholders who are some relevant population of people. And diverse means, well, you've kind of got the proportions in whatever this group is you're talking about that are similar to that of the um, of whatever this, this reference population is. And it turns out that those different concepts ma matter because there are different reasons why you might want diversity for, in one of these ways rather than another. So. So 
to answer the question in real, really short terms, yes, you can measure it. There's lots of different ways to measure it, and not everybody agrees about what are the right ways and which is the best way might depend on what you're trying to do or what, what the problem is you want to address. Right. But you have to start from somewhere, exactly. right? That's the important thing. If mm -hmm. you just say, oh my God, it's just so overwhelming to even think about this, mm -hmm. I don't even know where to begin. Mm -hmm. What gets measured gets done. We know this, mm -hmm. right? If you begin from someplace, and you don't know where you need to go if you don't know where you are right now. Mm -hmm. So even start the process of actually asking questions of how many people who identify as being part of a systemically disadvantaged group are part of your organization. Mm -hmm. But just counting those individuals is not enough. You need to do the quantitative and the qualitative data as well. Because you can have a lot of people in your institution, but if they don't have the will, the determination, or the ability to make change, they're just submerged within the sea of other voices that will never be heard. So you really need to ask other questions, like are their perspectives valued within the organization? So it's qualitative, quantitative, and then embedding some of those issues, some of those values into the core competencies and accountability for your organization. That's where you have to begin. Well, I'll jump in a little bit. I, I love uh, what uh, Daniel and Yao talk about. I also, maybe I'll introduce a, a mathematical concept about asymptotes. The, the idea of asymptote is that there is a point where you want to get to, but you never get to, but you always strive to get to it. I think it's, it's important as we are lifelong learners that, that I think we need to have these type of measures understand quantitative and qualitative. How do we continue to measure up to it? How do we continue to strive? But I would also submit that we will never all of us be able to learn everything about diversity. And so it's to open our minds to say, at some point, there will be things we don't understand. How do we continue to strive towards it? And it's that striving that not only will improve the scale of measuring quantitatively and qualitatively how diversity is, but also help us to really move towards that post, as opposed to moving behind or stopping at a certain area and then say, I've done enough. Thank you very much. And just quickly, to just, pin, just to follow up on that, I think if we think about it that way, it opens up the possibilities for a whole different way of learning. Because really a commitment to equity and inclusion is to encourage a heightened sense of human flourishing for each individual within your organization. Because all our possibilities and potentials are limitless. That's what you're encouraging us when you think about that horizon. It's for each one of us to reach our potential and that's the real promise of equity and inclusion. So I think what's interesting, so sorry, just about from an organizational point of view, there are a lot of organizations who sort of want to nail this and move on, right? Let's get this done, it's a business goal, let's hit it. But I think that that perspective, diversity is always changing. If we think of even about the gender binary, our understanding of gender is changing every day, right? So if we think about our societies are going to continue to evolve, diversity is going to continue to evolve. So we don't even know what diversity is going to look like in 50 years. But we as leaders and as individuals need to be adaptable and continually curious and stepping in and recognizing we want to make open space for those who come forward who are not like, 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 um, to create that space so everyone can reach their potential. So yeah, I appreciate the comments a lot. All right, so we have another question that is very interesting, um, speaking of action. Um, to reach equity, people with privilege, white, male, straight, etc., need to give up some of their power. What are you doing in your life in regards to that? I love this question. I think about this I a lot. Too. I think about this a lot because um, the space that I'm working in is a lot about looking at leadership and how leadership is fairly, in, in a corporate structure, is, is fairly masculine in how we define what good leadership is, and there's an aspiration to that. And um, I think a lot about that question of giving up and losing, and I think that that's a very tricky conversation to have. And I don't think we've, I don't think we've figured out how to have it, and I don't think uh, we've really figured out as a society of what that means. I think within organizations, the social justice uh, type of language doesn't resonate at all. It's very much business case. Business case, business case, business case. But I think the idea of moving aside or giving up or making space for is still a very touchy uh, piece. And so in the, in the corporate world, in the world that I'm sort of working in, a lot of it is how do we engage men and how do we create more men as allies? And that's about as far as it's gone. Mm -hmm. This is a question for Daniel. What was the relation between your status as a spousal hire uh, and the issue of diversity in the workplace. Are spousal hires a marginalized group? 
It's an interesting question. Uh, that might, that's like food for conscious, consciousness raising. Maybe you should have, you know, the, the spousal hires should all get together and uh, talk about our experiences and see, see if, we, if there's any commonalities. Uh, you know, I don't know if, if spousal hires should be considered a um, marginalized group in general. I mean, but, but uh, I would say that I think it's, it's the situation of not being chosen because somebody thought you fit not being chosen, be, being chosen because, and basically the way it works is you are good enough. You had to satisfy, the department had to agree this is someone who's good enough to be in our department. And, and that was, you, you crossed some threshold and the other, you know, there's some other department, we really want to hire this Canada Research Chair and we want to get you on board with this. So, um, yeah, so, but how is, how, is, how is it relevant to diversity? Let me just, uh, and I fit into, my own experience being an example of how hiring someone who doesn't fit can actually be useful, or someone who you hired, I would say, that doesn't fit too, someone who isn't hired for fit can be useful. Uh, so some of the collaborations that I've had with colleagues in my department in SPPH are things that I think certainly they just wouldn't have done if I hadn't been there to, to work on it with them. So I, I've um, done some work on ethical issues related to um, uh, research on, on treatments for opioids where it was a colleague that I invited to speak in a, in a class that I teach, and she talked to me, well, here's this ethical issue I have in my research. And I said, well, geez, that's how people are talking about it, but that's not really what it is. It's really this other thing. And I had this other way of looking at it, and we ended up working on this together. And that's something that just wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been there. If they hired somebody who fit, you know, there would have been something else. Now, maybe that the other person who fit would have done lots of really great work, too, but certainly they, the, the person who fit would do things that would be, I don't know, more expected than usual. So I don't know if that's a, enough to justify my, my presence here, but. <laughs> we, we have another question. Um, why is the term diversity and inclusion so much more socially acceptable than social justice or anti-oppression when the latter are, oh, yeah, disappeared. Um, anybody who wants to tackle that? I mean, just I, I, I raised it because I said in the corporate world, that's just my experience of what I've seen is that when, when social justice language comes out in the, it's the right thing to do, it has less weight than, this, than the business case, which is it's about talent and it's about innovation and it's about reflecting your market and it's about revenue. That captures more attention than a social justice. I don't know why, but. There's, there's, a, there's a history behind that. I don't know if people don't know this. So that there's a history that traces back to a Supreme Court decision in 1978 in the United States. Are people familiar with the Powell decision? This was a decision that was about um, a hiring practice at UC Davis in the medical school where they would set aside a certain number of positions uh, in the school um, for, uh, not, not jobs, but for applicants, applications for students um, for, for a number of different minority groups, including indigenous people. And, this was challenged in the Supreme Court by a white applicant who had applied twice and been refused both times. And the Supreme Court was totally split on this. Four said, no, this is really against the Civil Rights Act, which was passed in the United States in the 1960s, and said you couldn't make um, decisions in education based on race. And another four said, no, 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 it's okay to make decisions based on race. That's compatible with Title IX so long as the, decision, the, uses, the use of race is to respond to and redress and you know, block discrimination or past discrimination. The justice who sort of split the difference gave the business case. For those who don't, aren't familiar with the business case, the business case goes, don't talk about all this equity stuff and about justice. No, 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 no. That's not the right reason. You're not allowed to give that reason. The, real, the only acceptable reason is going to be you have to show that the diversity is beneficial for the institution, in this case, an educational institution. Now, that was an accident of history and who happened to be on the Supreme Court, but it's something that had huge implications for just shaping discussions about diversity. So in the, the 2000s, when University of Michigan had a number of big Supreme Court cases about their, their application procedure, they went with the business case, not equity. Why? Because they knew that the equity arguments would not work in the Supreme Court. And that kind of carried over to a lot of other contexts. And so I think now people have this discussion. And I completely agree with the question, like, why aren't we talking about justice? In my own view, diversity should never be used as a substitute for talking about justice ever. I mean, it's got some marginal relationship to justice, but it's not the same thing. And the questions about redressing a discrimination that's in the past or in the present, those should never be put off the table in the name of diversity, in my view. 
All right, we have another question. Um, UBC senior leadership VPs and deans are and deans are also primarily white. How do we get more diversity, people of color, in top positions? I guess that's mine. <laughs> Everyone looked at you. <laughs> Although I would this look forward UBC. to all the things that you're thinking about. You know, we are, we've made really significant strides in thinking about this question. We have a race and leadership group here at UBC that has been really asking this important question, how do we begin to diversify the people who are in positions in power at this university? And I really want to applaud the work that the race and leadership group has done on this particular issue because they've identified the problem and come up with some concrete solutions to dealing with it. And one thing that we've been working on is thinking about the fact that if you look at the number of deans at this university, there's only one dean who identifies as a person of color right now at this university. So how do we think about identifying individuals who would make extraordinary deans here at this university who identify as members of systemically disadvantaged groups? The way is to look at how those people get chosen. Who gets tapped on the shoulder for these opportunities? Why would they even think about applying to be dean? A lot of them think that they're not even eligible, and some of them are like, why would I want that job? We have to make sure that they know that they are people that we want in these positions. We have to make those positions more attractive to them, and also think about ways of encouraging them to stay once they're in those positions. So again, this involves a big culture change. It involves a different way of thinking. It also involves thinking about leadership courses that we offer here at UBC. So those individuals who are actually invited to be in those leadership courses, are they people of color or members of systemically disadvantaged groups more broadly? How do we bring them into the fold and give them that training? These are some of the steps that we're thinking about right now at UBC. All right, um, we have a question for Tina. What's your read on the eight out of 10 elected councillors for Vancouver being, in brackets, white women? Do we really have a gender diversity problem in leadership? I think if you look at one subset in one election, you can say, okay, we're making strides there. But if you look overwhelmingly at the organizations in British Columbia, Minerva does a scorecard report that we published last week. And you know, the, of the top 50 companies in British Columbia, so these are the drivers of our economy. These are the big, big companies that are generating the most economic activity and the most uh, revenue for our province because we look at it by the GDP. And you know, currently there's 17% of women represented in executive, senior executive leadership. 17% of the top 50 companies are women. And if we look at board seats, it's 22%. So when we look at our, you know, when we talk about diversity, inclusion, belonging, we look at, you know, gender is a natural place to start because if we, and, and I'm speaking about gender in a, in a broad term and an inclusive term, but if we look at sort of the male-female dynamic, um, women have been shut out from those leadership positions and the influence there, if we think about, you know, the, those businesses and what they're driving and the change in technology, to have pretty well a fairly homogenous group of leaders at the top with certain way of thinking, certain level of ed education. I do think that the city council, I think it's great that there's more women, but I know that the comment came forward about diversity. I know the story uh, that broke as well about sort of how else does it reflect our populations and the people in our city. I think those are still conversations that need to be had. Um, so it, I don't think it's totally solved, but I think it's, I think it's interesting that people comment and say when there's eight out of 10 women, you know, let's comment about that, but when there's, you know, nine out of nine Supreme Court justices in the U.S. who are male, it's not discussed, right? So, I don't know, I think it's, I think it's a positive move, and I think there's lots of work to be done. Awesome, thank you. Um, to any of you, any advice for those of us who have somehow been hired despite being quote-unquote misfits in our organizations, how do we survive? It's actually a really good question. Maybe I should answer this question since that seems to be <laughs> implicitly true. You know, so when I began here at UBC in this position, I came from a philosophy department where I, and so now I was put into the Center for Applied Ethics in the School of Population Public, which much more diverse in the sense of the, the, the backgrounds of the people in the department. And so I, I had some friends who were similar, in similar kinds of positions where they were in departments at least part of the time for at least part of their appointment that weren't, the depart weren't in the field that they were trained in. I asked them, well, what, what do you do in this situation? And the advice that I got was find people to collaborate with. Find people who are just think that what you do is interesting or relevant or important in some way, and you learn about what they do, and they learn about, and you find some project you can work on together. So that's basically what I did. And I tried to, you know, I mentioned um, the, the project about the ethics and the opioid treatments, and that was really the first one, first project like that where I found here's somebody who, you know, 
we, we sort of get along with. And you know, anybody who's had experience coming, trying to uh, have collaborations is a little bit like dating. I mean, you have to kind of have someone you can get along with. You've got to be complimentary. If they're too similar to you, it's just not going to work. But anyway, so there's all of that that goes into it. But you have to find, that was my advice, try to, try to find people you can work with and find commonalities. And I, like then, your, I like your point about collaboration, though, yeah. as, as someone who's like the only indigenous person in my, yeah. in BC, there yeah. was two of us mm -hmm. until like a couple weeks ago. Um, and I, I bring as many indigenous, like mm -hmm. a young indigenous woman today mm -hmm. come into the office and I'm very accessible mm -hmm. that way. And also finding champions. Mm -hmm. There's always like for a very long time, mm -hmm. it was sort of like no one gave a crap about indigenous stories. Mm -hmm. But there was that one woman and she was a powerhouse. Mm -hmm. um, and just to really like, you know, um, to, to be aware, there's always somebody in your office who really believes in you and what you do, mm -hmm. um, but it might take many years <laughs> until that one person is there. Um, sorry, that was not very hopeful, but... Um, can, I, can I inject a yeah. I, the last few questions are very, uh, very well asked and, and also very well answered. Uh, I also want to bring out a, a perspective um, that I think finding, a, finding people, like-minded people, to advance is important. Finding a champion that would, that would support you is very important. Uh, the other thing I, I learned from, uh, this is not an original thought, is uh, I want to acknowledge Dr. Alika Lafontaine, uh, one of the really well-known uh, physicians across Canada, mm -hmm. actually leading a lot of work on, on, uh, on reconciliation. Uh, he said something very, very powerful to me. He was saying that, you know, uh, he feel, and in fact, I wonder, I call you amongst us, you lead when you are a leader. Uh, he's calling the fact that when he has the floor, he would speak very passionately about this. But he needs to understand when he needs to yield the floor for those who have lived experience to speak. Mm. And so I think that's very important, that all of us are our own leaders. And so how do we voice how we feel? How do we share it? And also all our leaders here amongst you, when do we yield the floor? because we don't have all the experiences. And so, and so for a forum like this, that we can have this kind of conversation, how do we continue to spread this outside of these four walls, and how do we engage? I think it's going to be very important. Can I just add something to that really quickly? Yeah. You know, one thing that we haven't talked about today in terms of how it is that we move forward, we haven't thought a lot about self-care tonight, and I think it's really important to think about this. The great uh, feminist uh, writer, Audre Lorde, has always said, self-care is an act of political warfare. <laughs> and it's always stuck with me. I feel like I need to have that like, emblazoned above my laptop and just remind myself of that all the time. Because this is hard work. It's emotional, back-breaking work. And you have to find your allies, and you have to think about how you can take care of yourself. Do you have spaces for laughter, for loving, and living as well It's part of this work? So it really is about finding those spaces where you can thrive and not just survive, right? It's about finding a place where you can have a sense of place. I think that's a really great place to end. Yeah, I think that's a really positive note to end. Um, that is it for now. Um, thank you all. That was a phenomenal conversation. I learned so much. I feel inspired. And thank you all for your questions as well. Some of those were very provocative and pointed. Good for you. It's awesome. <laughs> right on. And at this time, I'd like to turn things back over to our host, Sarah Jane, for our closing remarks. Thanks very much, uh, Angela. <clears throat> uh, so thank you very much for your wonderful moderating. Um, it, you did a great job, and the questions were, were uh, really interesting. Um, and also thank you to, to all of our speakers, to, to Tina, to Daniel, to Manal, and to Kendall. Um, let's give them one last round of applause. So at UBC, we are committed to facilitating these important conversations, um, like the one tonight and, and others that we have coming up. And I encourage you to keep the conversation going with all the perspectives shared by our panel uh, and by our moderator and by the questions that were raised by you um, this evening. Uh, take this with you beyond the room um, and uh, 
join us in continuing to promote informed opinions and choices in our communities around equity and inclusion. Um, feel free to use tonight's podcast or video recording, which will be found on our website, to share tonight's conversation with your social networks. Uh, and I hope to welcome you back here uh, next semester for our second signature event as part of our Inclusive Future Dialogue series. If you have ideas around future topics, please let us know via a follow-up survey that you will receive um, after this event. Uh, and I also want to just have a quick note about our institutional efforts around inclusion. Specifically, um, we're uh, underway at the moment developing our um, UBC Inclusion Action Plan. And so for those of you who are here as members of our community, I urge you to stay tuned for opportunities to get involved with that. Um, another thank you to our webcast partner, uh, the Irving K. Barber Learning Center, and again to our incredible speakers. And of course to all of you for choosing to be part of tonight's conversation. Um, I invite you to uh, enjoy yourselves at our reception where we can continue the conversation. Thanks very much.